I'd like to thank the organizers for the opportunity to present today. My name is Dr. Susan Domchek. I'm the director of the Vassar Center for BRCA at the University of Pennsylvania. And today I'm gonna to be talking about what's new in hereditary cancer with a bit of a focus on prevention. Obviously you've spent the last couple of days learning about what's new. So this is really gonna be a snapshot and try an attempt to pull it all together. These are my disclosures. When we talk about germline genetic testing, we really talk about how this can serve as a paradigm for individualized care. Knowledge of a germline cancer susceptibility gene can result in better risk assessment, knowing what cancers you're at risk for, uh, disease prevention, knowing how to try to, how to decrease your risk of cancer, and if you're diagnosed with a cancer, therapeutic strategies. We often talk about BRCA1 and BRCA2 as a prototype of how we've learned about this information, but a lot of what we've learned applies to other, other situations as well. And today I wanna to really uh, try to get to disease prevention, including non-surgical disease prevention. With re regard to risk assessment, what we've learned in the last year has to do with some of the other uh, genes apart from BRCA1 or 2. I think as this group knows, there has been a rapid rise in multi-gene testing. And by that, I mean, when individuals go for genetic testing, instead of looking for mutations in one or two genes, looking in many genes at the same time. Uh, and Alison Kurian, who I know has spoken at this conference, um, has reported on this. And what you can see in the hash marks, these are all individuals who have, who have what we call variants of unknown significance in genes, which are things that we don't use to impact medical management, but obviously need to be sorted out. But there has been also a rise in the purple bar, in the uh, teal bar here, in mutations in genes other than BRCA1 and 2, which are seen here in purple. So one of the questions we have to ask is, what are the risks um, and relevance of these gene uh, mutations, particularly in the general population? And here, uh, in, in, led by Fergus Couch, but we were glad to be part of this, uh, this is a large population study of breast cancer susceptibility genes um, in 32,000 women with breast cancer and 32,000 unaffected women. And one of the important things about this study is that these were women who were unselected. Uh, so these are not individuals selected for family history or type of breast cancer, but really are more reflective of the general population. And what we saw in this study in those 32,000 women with breast cancer, 2.6% of them had a a pathogenic variant or mutation in BRCA1, BRCA2, or PALB2. So this gives us sort of a solid estimate of uh, how often these uh, mutations are found in these genes. And importantly, this also showed what the risks were in the general population. And here you can see that for BRCA2, the odds ratio of, uh, of, of breast cancer in individuals that had a mutation BRCA2, this is actually somewhat lower than past reported risks. So in individuals that aren't selected for family history, the risks may be lower um, in uh, BRCA2 and PALB2 mutation carriers. These risks are still high, but as we test more and more individuals who don't have a strong uh, family history, we have to be aware that there are things that modify the lifetime risk of cancer, and that includes uh, what your personal and family history is. In addition to BRCA1 and 2, 1.86% uh, of individuals had pathogenic variants in CHECK2 or ATM. And interestingly, if you look at those individuals in the general population with ATM mutations, the odds ratio for cancer was 1.8. And this is just notable because just having a first degree relative with breast cancer, uh, an odds ratio is around two. So these are not um, strikingly increased risks. And it's important to realize that ATM and CHECK2 in particular may be a risk factor, not the only risk factor, and that they almost certainly combine with family history and other types of um, uh, risk assessments like single nucleotide polymorphisms, which you might have heard about, uh, to combine to get that cancer risk. So we're learning more and more about cancer risks uh, of these genes in the general population. We are also learning about how to use this information of mutations in other genes for therapeutic strategies. Uh, so here's a study, again, we were lucky enough to be involved with, led by Nadine Tung out at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute. 
And in this study called Labrib Expanding, individuals were enrolled in the study if they had metastatic breast cancer and had mutations either in their blood, in the germline, in CHECK2, ATN, or PALB2, et cetera, or if they had a mutation in their tumor, which wasn't inherited, so not born with, not germline, but the tumor itself had it, including those with BRCA1 and 2 in their tumors, or ATN, or PALB2. Again, this was metastatic breast cancer with the drug that was given was Alaprin, one of the PARP inhibitors that I think you've heard quite a bit about uh, at this conference. And here what you can see is that in the individuals with mutations they were born with, these germline mutations, the responses, tumor shrinking is below the line here, tumor growing is above the line, and all the cases where the tumor shrank, and particularly beyond this dotted line here, which we consider a partial response, these were all in individuals who had germline PALB2 pathogenic variants. However, individuals who had mutations in CHECK2 or ETM, their tumors did not shrink uh, with PARP inhibitors. So it really matters, the specific gene mutations matter. And to summarize this here, of those 11, it's still a low number and we're expanding this trial, but of those 11 individuals who had germline PALB2 mutations, over 80% their tumor shrank. So this is a, this is a quite um, a striking finding. And again, larger sample sizes are needed. If you look at those individuals' tumors that have mutations, again, these are, are tumor mutations, not uh, those that individuals were born with. What you can see, excuse me, uh, what you can see is that the responses now are in blue, and these are all the tumor BRCA1 and 2 mutations. And that's summarized here, which is uh, in the, with tumor mutations that were not um, in the blood Again, 50% of the time, the cancers shrank, which is a nice finding. Um, so the information about a BRCA1 and 2 in tumors, uh, PALB2 mutations in the blood, can lead to specific targeted therapies. But now we want to get to that next really important question uh, for this group, which is how can we prevent cancer from developing in individuals who have mutations in BRCA1, BRCA2, and other genes. And I, you know, I think this is uh, really important for this group. Um, we know that uh, we have options for prevention, but we know that our surgical options are not where we want to end. So as a reminder for this group, focusing here on BRCA1 and 2, we know that mutations, or otherwise known as pathogenic variants, in BRCA1 and 2 Strikingly increased risk of, breast, uh, risk of breast cancer. For BRCA1, usually triple negative breast cancer. For BRCA2, usually estrogen receptor positive breast cancer. There's also an elevation in male breast cancer risk, for, particularly for BRCA2. There's an increased risk of ovarian cancer, more for BRCA1 than 2. Increased risk of pancreas, more BRCA2 than 1 and an increased risk of aggressive prostate cancer, again, more for BRCA2. And what we have known, uh, found out over the years, that even though the lifetime risk of breast cancer is very high and the lifetime risk of ovarian cancer is very high, we know that surgical removal of the breast massively reduces the risk of breast cancer to a risk of more like one to 2% and remove the ovaries decreases the risk to more like two to 3%. So these are striking decreases in risk. And we have also shown in the past that removal of the ovaries is associated with a reduction in mortality for individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. So we've also shown, as alluded to before, that these drugs called PARP inhibitors, uh, which are uh, a certain type of drug that targets the defect uh, the homologous recombination repair defect in BRCA1 and 2 associated cancers. And multiple of these drugs have been approved by the FDA for BRCA1 and 2 associated cancers. Specifically, alaprib and talazoprib have been approved in BRCA1 and 2 related breast cancer, alaprib and recaprib in prostate cancer, alaprib in pancreatic cancer, and alaprib, recaprib, and noraprib in ovarian cancer. 
of note, all of these are, are the cancers that are strongly associated with BRCA1 or 2. Otherwise, we consider this canonical tumors, if you will. Um, we have not yet seen evidence that if you have a BRCA mutation, but you have a other cancer type, for instance, lung cancer, that is not strongly associated with BRCA1 and 2, um, that these drugs, these drugs work. But the question, as I'll get into in a minute, is whether or not we could use this information um, for um, prevention purposes. So let's talk about prevention for a moment. Um, the idea of prevention, or one could consider it disease interception, stopping the cancer from becoming important. So on the left here is a cell that, if you will, you're born with. You have one good copy of BRCA1 and one bad copy of BRCA1. At the earliest first hit, or one, and most of the time when cancers develop, the second copy of BRCA1 is lost. Then the, something happens. We're not exactly sure of all the details, but now the first cancer cells develop. And usually these, we can't detect these. We can only detect when they get to a big enough number of cells to detect an early stage cancer. And then at some point, this disease becomes metastatic. When we do drug development in general, we start with looking to see whether or not we can, a drug can work in the metastatic setting. Can it shrink metastatic cancers? If it can shrink metastatic cancers and the drug is well tolerated, next it's taken into an earlier stage to see whether or not we can prevent cancers from coming back outside the breast, for instance, in the bones and the liver of the lungs. We consider this adjuvant therapy. If that works, oftentimes we take it into the prevention setting. So a drug like tamoxifen, which is used to treat estrogen receptor positive cancers, went through this pathway. It was shown to work in metastatic cancers, then early stage, and even has an FDA approval for prevention. So the question is, how can we think about um, using this pathway to, to intercept all these different stages and prevent cancer from developing in the first place? So a couple of, of, of comments, uh, a couple of different potential strategies for what we might consider disease interception. One is that you could take a disease specific approach. So you could say, how can I prevent ovarian cancer? And we know for instance, that birth control pills do decrease the risk of ovarian cancer. They may also have a small increase in breast cancer. So they're a little complicated, but we do know they decrease ovarian cancer. We also know that there are medications that have been proven <clears throat> in phase three trials to decrease the risk of breast cancer. <clears throat> Two of these, raloxifen and tamoxifen, have been approved by the FDA for this purpose. <clears throat> and uh, aromatase inhibitors, specifically exemestane, has also been shown to decrease the risk of breast cancer in healthy individuals. But they have side effects, including the potential for hot flashes and night sweats, and for the aromatase inhibitors, bone loss. But those are disease-specific approaches. Another approach could be a pathway approach. For instance, you have a BRCA mutation, we recognize that, that pathway that I just showed in the last slide, where are there opportunities to intervene along the way? Another approach may be an immune approach. There is ever-increasing evidence of the value of the immune system in cancer. And how can we use this knowledge related to the immune system um, to our advantage? And then finally, uh, a point that I'm not going to get into too much today, but how does early detection fit in? For instance, if we knew that we could find ovarian cancer at an early treatable stage, then we might not be, have to do surgical prevention as early as we do it right now. So these are, and, and if prevention wasn't perfect, but early detection was excellent, we could use that as a two-pronged strategy. Uh, so that's another place where we have a lot of work to do. So let's talk about prevention approaches. So one really interesting approach, and many of you may have heard from Judy Garber on, on this already uh, at this session, but I thought it was worth bringing it up to the larger group, which is, the idea of using rank ligand as a potential target for breast cancer prevention in BRCA uh, mutation carriers. So this is the paper on which the trial is based. 
And the diagram depicts the identification of precursor cells for the basal-like triple negative breast cancers more common in BRCA carriers. Um, and these precursor cells overexpress rank ligand, therefore inhibiting rank ligand by a drug called denosumab could block the pathway from precursor to cancer. Uh, denosumab is also known as Xgeva um, and Prolia and uh, is a medication that is used widely both um, for osteoporosis and uh, in uh, the uh, cases of uh, breast cancer. So there is a large clinical trial called the BRCA pre P trial, which is an international random double-blind placebo control trial looking at denosumab versus placebo on the impact of breast cancer in women with the BRCA mutation. The overall principal investigator is Christian Singer in Austria, and in the United States, Judy Garber and Judith Hopkins are leading the efforts. 2,900, over 2,900 women will uh, be enrolled. Um, these trials cannot be done uh, without you, uh, and women will be randomly assigned to denosumab uh, versus placebo uh, for five years uh, to see, again, uh, of what this impact will be. And the overall goal is to evaluate the risk of breast cancer, both invasive and non-invasive breast cancer in women with germline mutations uh, who are treated with denosumab versus placebo. Other aims are to look specifically at invasive cancer, to look specifically at triple negative breast cancer, to look at other cancers, to look at whether denosumab impacts how often one needs to do breast biopsies, and uh, to look at rate the risk of osteopenia or osteoporosis, given that these drugs also uh, uh, are helpful to the bones. These are the various sites that uh, plan to enroll in this study. Again, um, this, is, uh, uh, the, uh, this is not quite up and running, although should be soon. Uh, and this is uh, going to take uh, really a lot of cooperation to get this done but we're hopeful that this will um, uh, be a, a good strategy uh, for prevention. Next, I wanna talk about the PERP inhibitors for potential prevention. So I mentioned that these PERP inhibitors have been studied in several cases. And this is a slide looking at the PERP inhibitor elaborate in metastatic BRCA associated breast cancer, demonstrating an improvement in what we call progression-free survival with Olaparib compared to standard chemotherapy. And progression-free survival just means the time until the cancer starts to, to grow again. Uh, so this did demonstrate a, a significant improvement in progression-free survival, although not nearly, of course, as good as we would like it, and a doubling of the response rate where 60% of tumors shrank in the Olaparib group compared to 30% in the standard chemotherapy group. What we learned from this study was not only that this drug was active, but also that, uh, that individuals tolerated the drug reasonably well. That is not to say that this is not without its side effects, but more that compared to standard chemotherapy, uh, health-related quality of life actually improved um, from baseline as opposed to standard chemotherapy where quality of life got worse. Quality of life in general can get better as um, cancer improves. So these two are not unrelated. So what we've learned from PARP inhibitors in metastatic breast cancer is that both Olaparib and Talazoprib improve what we call progression-free survival, response rate, and most importantly, health-related quality of life compared to non-platinum chemotherapy. Not yet seen as, as an overall survival benefit has not yet been seen. And there can be side effects of nausea, fatigue, and anemia. But generally speaking, we can usually manipulate things to get people feeling better on these. So what about, that's the metastatic setting. And I mentioned earlier that, that earlier that once we show that something works in advanced cancer, we try to take it earlier. And there are reasons to think that potentially giving a drug earlier might be better, in part because this could avoid, uh, potentially avoid what we call acquired resistance, the tumor cells sort of getting used to give a treatment. The data I show here are from the, the, uh, the SOLO1 trial, 
looking at BRCA-associated ovarian cancer. Ovarian cancer is treated uh, somewhat differently from breast cancer, where and women get six cycles of chemotherapy and then usually get nothing. And here, um, after those six cycles of chemotherapy, women were randomly assigned to get a PARP inhibitor, Olaparib, versus a placebo. And it's clear that Olaparib uh, significantly improved on the time uh, before cancer came back. Uh, so we wanted to take this earlier in the breast cancer setting. And here is the Olympia trial. Um, I don't come up with these names, but other clever people do, but this is adjuvant elaborib. And what we mean by adjuvant is cancer that's in the breast and lymph nodes, treated with all the treatment that you need. And then women were randomly, and, and some men were randomly assigned one-to-one -to, -one to either a lab herb for a year or a sugar pill for a year. In this ca case, women, uh, individuals had to be, have pretty high risk cancer to come on to this study. For instance, if they got chemotherapy before their surgery, they had to have, if triple negative, some disease left. If estrogen receptor positive, there had to be a fair amount of disease left. And if they, if they had already had their surgery, either over two centimeters or a positive lymph node for triple negative disease or for estrogen receptor positive disease for more positive lymph nodes. Uh, so these were, this was a high risk situation and we were looking at how often cancer came back outside the breast. So on the top left, this is invasive disease-free survival. And by that, we mean cancer coming back either in the breast or outside the breast. And at three years, the difference was 9% uh, 9 um, when we look at distant disease-free survival, cancer coming back outside the breast, again, at three years, a difference of 7%. Um, uh, percent. These are pretty large numbers in breast cancer. Overall survival, uh, the, it, we, have, we have not had enough follow-up yet, um, but at three years, the difference was 3.7%. This did not meet statistical significance based on the study design, so further follow-up is recommended but this is an active drug to prevent cancers from coming back outside the breast. And another question is, can it also prevent another cancer from developing in the setting of the first one? So this is a summary of the adverse events. And again, uh, the, uh, you know, people have had chemotherapy, they take a lap rib. Uh, most of the time, um, the side effects they have are pretty, um, uh, pretty minor, uh, but sometimes they're serious. Uh, we did look to see whether there was a difference in leukemia between the two arms, and we did not see a difference in leukemia between the laparib arm or the sugar pill arm. And when we looked at new primary cancers, the numbers are still, still too small, uh, but we see 32 new uh, second cancers in the placebo group and 19 in the laparib group. So there were somewhat more second cancers, including breast cancer and ovarian cancer in the placebo group. This may suggest uh, that there, there, there could be a decrease in the risk of second cancers, but we need to follow this and look for more data. Importantly, when looking at quality of life, um, comparing a lab rib to the sugar pill, the curves are near overlapping in terms of overall quality of life. That's not to say the lab rib does not have side effects such as nausea and fatigue, just more that these are relatively minor um, uh, when you consider um, other, uh, other ways people are feeling soon after chemotherapy. So again, PARP inhibitors may play a role for prevention, but now we have to figure out things like dose and schedule, and we need to do studies of this, but this is um, something that is a possibility. And lastly, I wanna talk about the immune system. So, you know, I think uh, with COVID, I don't need to emphasize uh, enough that immune prevention of infection was the previous great immune revolution. Um, we give childhood vaccines to prevent illnesses and giving a vaccine after people have had something generally doesn't work. When we look at past trials of cancer vaccines in patients who already actively had advanced cancer, they don't, uh, these things don't work particularly well, even if, they, even if they're safe and they generate an immune response because the, the tumors and the patients have had an immune compromise. And so 
The other thing is that some of the immune therapies that you've heard about, the checkpoint inhibitors, do have a lot of toxicity, and that's generally not what we give healthy individuals. So we need to think about other approaches. And an approach is to consider vaccination to prevent cancer. Um, so we don't want to vaccinate a patient. We want to vaccinate healthy people before cancer develops. I'm from the University of Pennsylvania, and our, you know, our founder, Ben Franklin, was keen on aphorisms such as an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. In order to do this, we need to both have a universal tumor antigen, meaning something for the immune system to react to, and we need to have populations at high enough risk to test. And one advantage, if you will, of knowing individuals who have uh, inherited mutations that increase cancer risk is that that is a, uh, a cohort where we can consider vaccination and other preventative strategies. So with that in mind, one potential option, and this is not the only option, I'm just sort of giving you potential options um, for immune strategies, is something called HTERT. This is something that's universally expressed in all human cancer. It plays a critical role in cancers being cancers. And we have done studies over the years looking at peptides against this in metastatic breast cancer patients, showing that it was safe. Um, so the next step was to try to tweak the, the vaccine to make the vaccine better. Um, peptide vaccines don't usually develop a, a tremendous immune response. So a trial that was done by my colleague, Robert Bonderheide at the University of Pennsylvania, looked at telomerase DNA, TERT DNA, with or without something called IL-12 DNA in individuals who had had cancer and had a high risk of developing uh, cancer recurrence, but did not have metastatic disease. And because this is a plasmid-based vaccine, you give it in this device, which looks scary, but is actually not so bad, which is uh, little needles here, the vaccine goes through, and this device administers three electrical shocks, which help the vaccine get taken up. Sounds a lot worse than it is. Um, uh, and uh, people tolerate it actually quite well. This initial study, 93 patients enrolled, breast, ovarian, pancreatic, and other cancers, and individuals received four doses vaccine. Um, this vaccine was associated with a significant in induction of immune response, which is what you can see here. And in individuals with pancreatic cancer who usually do quite poorly, um, uh, individuals seem to do better than expected. This is not, this is, does not answer all the questions for sure, but it gave at least uh, some initial data. And our goal was to take this into an earlier stage. So last year, we actually did go to the FDA and ask to be able to proceed with a, a vaccine strategy using a DNA plasmid encoding HTERT, something called WT1 and PSMA alone or with IL-12 in individuals with BRCA1 and 2 mutations. Uh, we were about to get started when the pandemic hit. And so uh, we did not immediately launch this um, and we did not also wanna interact with COVID vaccines. Uh, so our current strategy is that we have two cohorts one, a cohort of 16 patients um, who have had prior cancer, and then a second cohort where we will vaccinate 28 individuals who have BRCA1 and 2 mutations who have not had cancer. Again, this is experimental to see whether it's safe and whether we generate an immune response. Uh, the COVID has really um, uh, held things up here, but we have vaccinated our first three patients with cancer. And again, we're currently vaccinated individuals with who've had a prior cancer, who have no known metastatic disease at this time. Um, and so uh, we will keep you up to date. So in conclusion, there are real viable strategies for non-surgical prevention that are being tested. Now, I don't know which ones will work out, but I do know that we are determined to figure out um, something besides offering surgical prevention. Um, I will also say that large-scale prevention studies are difficult, even in high-risk patients. You see that from the denosumabs trial, where 3,000 patients are required. We need to consider that BRCA1 and 2 and other uh, gene mutation carriers are at risk for multiple cancers, maybe not just breast cancer, but multiple cancers. And there's other areas uh, which may impact um, how we think about this, 
including improved age-specific risk, and as I mentioned before, improved early detection, which could have an impact on our study designs. I'm very lucky to work with a great group at the University of Pennsylvania, um, and uh, this is uh, them here. And so with that, I'm out of time, and I thank you for your attention, and uh, thank you for having me.